Okay, as usual, you're working in the emergency department when you get a call that you have a patient coming in. And you notice she's pregnant, very pregnant. And to make things work, she delivers in front of you. So now you have two patients, mom and baby. Since you have two patients, you really should have two docs in this case, one to look after mom and one to look after baby. But for this video, let's just say mom's okay, and let's focus on the baby. And to make it worse, the baby's a preemie. So now we're going to talk about neonatal resuscitations. I can't think of anything scarier than a pediatric code, and the scariest of the pediatric codes are these neonates. But it's actually not that hard if we take an organized approach to it. And this comes from the neonatal resuscitation chapter, part 15, from the 2010 ACLS guidelines from circulation November 2010. And this is the little flow sheet that they have in there on the second page, but we're going to go through everything, so don't worry about it. So 90% of these kiddos are not going to need any kind of resuscitation, and 10% need some intervention, and less than 1% require some extensive aggressive resuscitation. So it doesn't happen often, so that's good, but it also means we've got to stay on our toes because we're not going to see this often. So let's go back to our baby here. Which one is going to need any kind of resuscitation? Well, you can answer that question by asking three quick questions. Are they term? Do they have a good strong cry or are they breathing? And finally, do they have good tone? If you answer yes to all three of these, then the baby doesn't require any resuscitation. It's just normal newborn care. You know, dry the baby off, place them skin to skin with mom and keep them with mom, and you could cover them up with some dry linen so that they don't get cold. And, you know, of course, watch them. If you answer no to any of these, then it's time to do some resuscitator type things. First, you're going to do initial steps, which are going to include warming and drying and stimulating the baby and clearing the airway if necessary. Next, check pulse. If the pulse is over 100, then that's great, that's good, you are, uh, you know, watch the baby. But if the pulse is less than 100, then you're going to initiate ventilations, you know, with the bag valve mask, and you're going to do that on room air. Now, all of these steps that we just took here should take you less than a minute. In trauma, we have the golden hour, where re resuscitative measures taken there have the best chance for survival. Here, we have a golden minute, so you've got to do a lot of stuff in here to improve your chances for success. So you're going to give those ventilations about 30 seconds, and then we check a pulse again. So now we're at about 90 seconds, right? First we had the first golden minute, and now 30 seconds have passed. We're at 90 seconds or less. And now you check a pulse again. And I should mention, the best places really to check for a pulse, it's on the, the precordium, so on their chest, or at the umbilical stump. You're not going to feel little tiny carotids or little tiny femoral pulses. Go for the big pulses. If the pulse is greater than 100, phew, good job. Move on to your post-resuscitative care. If the pulse is between 60 and 100, well, you got to improve your ventilation somehow. And we'll talk about how to do that a little bit later. Now, if the pulse is less than 60, now it's time to get serious. We're going to start chest compressions. I'm going to crank that oxygen up from room air to 100%. Because at this point, we have a persistent bradycardia, right? It was bradycardic here. We took some interventions with a ventilation. We checked again 30 seconds later. It's still bradycardic. Chest compressions and oxygen. Then after this, we're going to check a pulse again, and if we're still less than 60, it's time for epinephrine. Okay, so we went through a lot here for this uh, neonatal resuscitations. The first thing we're going to do is ask ourselves three questions to determine whether they need resuscitation or neither. If, they, if they're term, if they have a good cry or a good tone, they have all three of those, they don't. If they don't have all three, then it's time to go on. First, try some initial things like stimulating the baby and clearing the airway if necessary. And then you're going to check a pulse. If the pulse is low, you're going to start ventilations on room air. Okay, you're going to do that for 30 seconds, and then you're going to check a pulse again. Now, if the pulse is oh, good, hooray. If it's kind of in the middle range, fix your ventilations. If it remains low, now it's time for chest compressions and crank that oxygen up. Check a pulse again. If it's still low, then it's time for epinephrine. Now, let's go through each one of these little uh, sections in a little bit more detail. So let's start with warming and drying the baby and stimulating. And it really depends on if the baby is full term or not. So term babies, or those greater than 1,500 grams, you're going to dry them off, and then you're going to wrap them up in a, uh, in a, in a you know, dry them off with a towel and wrap them up in a warm blanket. 
So the very low birth weight babies, the ones that are less than 1,500 grams, they're really, really susceptible to hypothermia. And our standard techniques are not going to work. So you need to do something more to warm them up. And they recommend things like uh, pre-warming the delivery room to 26 degrees Celsius. Uh, you can use radiant heat or uh, warmed mattresses. And the thing that I found kind of surprising is that you can also just wrap the baby in plastic. They say any kind of medical grade or food grade heat resistant plastic. I've heard that you don't even want to dry them off. You just want to put them in there uh, with all their secretions on them, get them in that warm plastic quickly. Now these babies are also prone to becoming hyperthermic too, so you gotta measure their temperatures as well. So they don't get too hot and they don't get too cold. Okay, so next let's talk about clearing the airway. It used to be that before the baby's shoulders were even delivered, you would grab the bulb suction and suction out the kid's airway. We don't do this anymore because this can cause them to become bradycardic. So the suctioning is only going to happen to the babies who have obvious obstruction to their normal breathing. The other thing that we used to do is any baby that was born with uh, meconium staining, that's the baby's first poop, uh, if they had that, then when the baby was born they were intubated and tracheal suctioning would go on. This really has not been shown to be too helpful either. So we're not going to do that either. Now the evidence is such that people, that the kids who have meconium standing and are floppy babies or in respiratory distress, those ones, go ahead and do it. There's been no evidence to support changing that practice. So only if they have both, the meconium standing and they're non-vigorous, then you intubate and suction. So our prior practice of just suctioning everyone, that's out the window. So now you're going to check a pulse, and if the pulse is less than 100, we're going to initiate ventilations via bag valve mask. That's positive pressure ventilations. And so we're going to initiate it by a bag valve mask, and we're not going to hook it up to the oxygen. We're going to hook it up to room air. They talk about if you have some sort of blended oxygen thing, you can use that. But go ahead and use room air otherwise, because we know that excessive oxygen can be toxic. And so... Let's talk about our goals here. Now you can attach a pulse ox at this point. They recommend not doing it up until now because it takes so long to get these things attached and you've been, you have a golden minute. You don't want to waste that minute doing other things. But now you can or have someone else do it. And there are certain special probes that work for neonates. But let's talk about where to put it. The probe should be put in a pre-ductal location because otherwise you're going to get that mixed blood. So put it on the right wrist or on the right hand. And what should our goal be? Now in adults, we want to reach 100%. We are freaking out if we got 98 or 96 or 92. Not in these neonates. Remember, excessive oxygenation uh, can be toxic. And you know what? They don't even get 100% oxygen even when they're normal. So at one minute, their pulse ox, 60 to 65%. Yeah, it's that low. And that's our goal. That doesn't seem right, but that's what we got to do. At five minutes, they'll be at about 80 to 85 percent. And at 10 minutes, they're at 85 to 95 percent. So don't shoot for 100 percent. And this makes sense. If there's an oxygen saturation of 100 uh, percent, you have no idea what the PaO2 is. It could be 106 or it could be 514, and we know these high numbers are too toxic. So let's not shoot for 100%. Let's go for these numbers here. And you want to give these ventilations at about 40 to 60 breaths per minute. And your goal really is to get that heart rate above 100. You can also look for chest wall rise, uh, but the goal is to get that heart rate above 100. Okay, so so far in this video we talked about asking the three questions and the initial steps, warming, drying, and stimulating, clearing the airway, checking a pulse, and then starting ventilations. All right, in the next video, we're going to go over the rest of this.